<clears throat> what about this other factor? How do we deal with this? Because this is a tough thing to treat. Because this, this is kind of like um, happening all the time for a person with ticks. Those reward, that, that reinforcement for ticking, the reduction of that unpleasant feeling, comes almost every time the person ticks. So how do you get rid of that? How does that go away? Well, that's tough to do, actually. But one of the things we, we've been able to discover is this, that when the urge happens, when that urge to tick pops up, if you're able, to, if you're able, not everybody's able, but if you're able to block the tick and hold that for long enough, what happens is the urge fades away. Okay. Not for everybody. Sometimes it takes a long time to happen, but the urge fades away. And the more you practice that, the better you get at it. Okay. The faster the urge fades away. Okay. We call that a process called habituation, and which is when you, when you suppress something, in front of the urge, the urge itself will start to go away. Now, you, you, that usually freaks people out. Well, you're telling them to suppress the ticks? Kind of. Kind of. I'm not talking about the kind of suppression you might be thinking of, though. The kind of suppression you think of is what your child does in school when they don't want to have any ticks, which is something like this. Don't tick, don't tick, don't tick, don't tick, don't tick, don't tick. And like nothing's getting out. That's not at all what I'm talking about. I'm talking about focusing on one tick, tick at a time. I'm talking about doing it in a very easy way, you know, it's not easy to do, but like in a very controlled way. Um, not this, all my mental effort, all my attention must be focused only on this. It's a very different kind of procedure. We use something called habit reversal training. And habit reversal training, uh, we believe, does create habituation to the premonitory urge, and it's designed to disrupt a habitual motor pattern that has already developed. What is it? It's an older, older treatment. It's actually been around for almost 40 years now. Um, it's been, it was developed by a couple uh, behavioral psychologists. Um, one, his name was Nathan Azarin, and his student, Gregory Nunn. He developed this in 1973. Now, many of you may not know Azarin's name. Most psychologists don't even know Azarin's name. They should, but they don't. But my guess is you've heard of things Azarin has had a really big uh, role in developing. Azarin was a psychologist who worked with B.F. Skinner. The, the famous behavioral psychologist from the 60s and 70s. Um, Azrin was a, a, a rat running pigeon, pigeon punishment guy. That's what he did. He did basic behavioral research in, in universities. And at some point he had a change of heart and he wanted to start doing more clinical work. And he started developing clinical uh, uh, treatments based on what he learned in the labs. And a couple of the treatments that he's had a, a big hand in developing, like you can almost say he's the founder of them. Um, have you ever heard of Time Out? That was, that was Azrin. Have you ever heard of something called token economy or sticker charts? Yeah. That was Azrin. So, the, I mean, these are core parenting things now. They're not like, you know, crazy things. We all kind of do these things. And, and Azrin was really kind of at the forefront of developing this. When he was kind of one of the founders of behavior therapy. And this is just one of the little things that he developed a long time ago that's been tested actually for a, a long, long time. It had three main components. Awareness training, competing response training, and social support. Awareness training is to teach the child, uh, we, we treat one tick at a time, by the way. We don't ever try to treat all ticks at one time. We try to te treat ticks from the most bothersome tick to the least bothersome tick, and we go one tick at a time. And we start with that first tick, and we, we first teach the child to become more aware of it. All right? Now, everybody with Tourette's syndrome knows that they have ticks, but they don't often know when they have ticks. You know, that, that there's, and there's a big difference. You can, you can know that you have ticks, but you don't always know when you have ticks. Now, some people do. Some people are hyper aware of it. But many times, people think they're more aware than they actually are. All right? So the first thing that we try to do is to teach kids to be more aware of when they're ticking. Now, some people get concerned and say, wait a minute, if you make your kid more aware of it, isn't that going to make their ticks worse? The answer is no, if you do it the right way. There's a difference between becoming self-aware and becoming self-conscious. Okay? Self-awareness is created when you teach, to point out to people that they're doing something in a very non-threatening, non-punitive way. Okay? That creates self-awareness. That gives you the basis for changing things. Self-consciousness uh, self is brought about by a very different history. Self-consciousness is brought about, uh, basically what self-consciousness is, is your po something's pointed out to you in a very negative way. You become aware of something through negative consequences. 
Okay? You get punished or yelled at or screamed at or belittled or made to feel stupid every time a behavior occurs. You'll become more aware of that behavior and you will feel bad that you are doing it. That's self-consciousness. Making someone self-conscious of their tics probably makes them worse. Making someone self-aware of their tics makes them ready for change. And so there's a difference there. We focus on enhancing self-awareness. We also do then, after they be, we train them to become more aware of their tics, we do something called competing response training. Competing response training is teaching them to do something that physically prevents the tic from happening. And they do this behavior for a minute or until the feeling goes away, whichever takes longer. Every time the, the feeling shows up, the urge shows up, or the tic itself happens. So it would look something like this. And it, we would do awareness training. We teach the child to be more aware. And actually, in the next session, I'll show you how that looks, what it actually looks like. But we teach you to, to be more aware of the tick. And um, it, it, it would say, every time you do the tick, we want you to do a competing exercise. Now, we'll pretend we have a child with a neck tick, like this. And so every time the child feels the urge in the back of the neck or even starts to do the movement, we would say, we want you to do a different movement. What I want you to do is uh, it's, we're going to call them your exercises. And I want you to put your chin down slightly and tense the sides of your neck. Just really gently, not so much that it hurts or shakes or anything like that, but just gently tense the side of your neck. And I want you to hold that position for a minute or until the feeling goes away, whichever is longer. At the end of the minute, you ask yourself, is the feeling still there? If it is, you keep going. If it's not, you, you uh, let go. Okay. So the kid does this. The end of the minute, the feeling's gone, then they just kind of relax their neck and go on. And then the urge comes back and they're right back to this. All right? They would do that over and over and over again. Now, a couple of things that people get concerned about, they ask, wait a minute, does the urge go away? Does it really go away? And the answer is for most people, yes, if you wait long enough. Sometimes the first wait, first couple waits are really long. I'm talking like an hour and a half. You know, That's yeah. very rare, but that can happen. All right? I can remember a case that we had. It was a person who had a very violent neck shaking tick. And, and he came to our clinic and he, he asked, you know, he, was, he had tried a lot of different kinds of medications and a lot of different kinds of things, considering deep brain stimulation at that point. And he, he came in and he, he was meeting with one of our, our, our therapists who was actually brand new, he had just started. Okay. And uh, the, the guy was talking about it, the patient was talking about it with the therapist and I was behind the mirror watching the session like I usually do when I'm training new therapists. And uh, this guy said, you know, I'm doing this, and I'm at the point where I'm, I'm going to, my, my physicians have told me I'll be paralyzed if I keep this up. I mean, it'll eventually cut into my, my, my spine, and that'll be it. I mean, I'll, I'll lose all feeling in my arms and, and potentially legs. And, uh, and, and my student asked him, well, how many times a day are you doing this violent neck jerking thing? And the guy said, about 80 times a day. And it was just this really, you could hear snap, crackle, and pop every time it would happen. And uh, so I got... You know, I looked at my student and he was turning like 16 shades of pale because he was so nervous about what he was seeing in front of him. So I ran around and, and started to talk to this guy and I said, look, you know, I want you to, uh, to understand what we're going to do in terms of treatment because I want you to understand what you're getting into before you actually start it. This, you've got a very serious case here. And I, I said, what we're going to teach you to do is to notice when you're about to do this tick. And I said, I bet you get a feeling in the back of your neck, you know, or somewhere around your neck before you do this. And he goes, yeah, it comes right up the back. And I said, okay, does it go away when you tick? And he goes, yeah, it does. For a short period of time, it goes away. I said, okay, uh, what we're going to teach you to do next session, not now, but what we're going to teach you to do next session is to notice when that feeling shows up and to notice um, when, you start, when you're doing the tick all the time. He goes, believe me, I know when it's happening. I said, okay. Well, then what we're going to teach you to do is to do something that prevents that tick from happening whenever you feel like you have to do it. And, and what, what we're going to find is that that feeling will probably go away over and over, if you practice it over and over and over again, that feeling will go away faster and faster and faster. And he said, that feeling goes away? That was his first question, that feeling goes away? And I said, well, in many cases, yeah, it takes a long time sometimes the first time, but if you practice it, it goes away faster and faster. He said, hmm, okay, well, I'll think about it and I'll give you a call for next week. So he called next week and again, I was behind the mirror, my student was in the room and my student uh, asks him, so how'd the week go? Ready to get started? He said, you know what? The week was awesome. And he said, well, you know, how many times did you tick? And he said, five times. And the, the, my student said, five times a day? That's great. Down from 80. And he goes, no, 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 five times the whole week. That was it. And the five that came out looked like this. 
And so I ran around the room and, and <laughs> wanted to find out what was happening because we hadn't treated anybody yet. We hadn't done anything yet. And, and so I asked him, I said, what? How, we didn't, you know, I, I like to be able to help people without doing anything. I mean, that's, that's great. If I could just wave a magic wand, but it seems a little unrealistic. What happened? He said, well, you know, I'd never thought about the fact that this urge could go away. And this guy was kind of scientifically trained. You know, he, was, he kind of had that mind about him. He wanted to test things, and he was, he was skeptical about things. He wanted to test it. He said, so, you know, as soon as I walked out of here, I had that urge run up the back of my neck. I felt it. And I decided, you know what, I'm not letting it out this time. Now, remember, people with tics can suppress their tics to some extent. They do have that ability in many cases. So he said, I just, I, I wasn't going to let it out. And it got so bad. He said that, that feeling just got awful. It got awful and awful. And I had an hour and a half drive home, and I, but I would not let it go. And it went up and down a little bit, but it was still pretty bad. It was intense, but I, I would not let it go. And I just kept driving. And he said, I got home. I talked to my wife and told her how the session went. And I went out into the garden. And then I, she came out. And we were talking. And before I knew it, it was gone. It was like maybe an hour and 50 minutes after I left your, your office, it, it was gone. I, it just faded away. And then as soon as I noticed it wasn't there, it was right there. And, and I did it again. And you know what? It only took maybe, I don't know, hour, 10 minutes maybe that time, and it went away again. And I just kept doing it, and now it's not there. And when it does slip out, it's usually so fast that I don't even notice that it happened. You know, it's just like that. It's like, oh, darn, I missed it. You know, it's just it, I don't have to do it anymore. The feeling has faded away. And that's, I think, the, the kind of the, the idea that we, we're, we're trying to go after a little bit. Now, is it that dramatic for everybody? Of course not. You know? And is this the magic kind of thing for everybody? Of course not. Anybody who tells you they've got something that's the cure, or any time that there sounds like there's something too good to be true, there's something too good to be true. They don't have the cure. So, you know, be skeptical always. Um, but for many cases, this can happen. Yeah. Is that like the same way with the Mm-hmm. Different exercise, because you can't stop breathing, but um, you know. <laughs> but it's the same idea. Actually, that's an easy way to treat it. You know, hold your breath till you pass out, and then if you're taking, you don't know it. And I guess that's the... So let's talk about habit reversal and the evidence. The evidence for habit reversal is extensive. There's more evidence for habit reversal in terms of raw numbers of studies than any medication out there for ticks, by far. It's not even close, actually, because there's 30 years of data collection behind this. Um, in 2007, it was determined to be an effective treatment by the American Psychological Association Clinical Psychology Division for uh, adults with Tourette's. There have been a lot of different trials that have been done, almost all of them showing some kind of benefit. The problem with all of these trials have been that they've been very small up until this date, and they have been published in journals that most physicians don't read, and most physicians um, are the, one, uh, the physicians are the ones who are getting these kids originally. You know, you go to your pediatrician, your neurologist, your allergist, all those kind of folks. Psychologist isn't the first person on your mind when your kid starts ticking, all right? So, you know, we've got to think about uh, where these things have been published. In about 2002, I think, um, the TSA uh, had been getting a lot of questions, I think would be a way to put it, um, suggestions from their membership about trying to come up with treatment alternatives. You know, how do we come up, you know, we've got some medications, but we seem to have hit a wall. We don't seem to have a lot of new stuff coming out in terms of treatment options. Do we have any non-pharmacological treatment options? Most parents are kind of hesitant to put their kids on medication of any sort at first. That's something they weigh heavily. You know, do we medicate? Do we not medicate? I just don't know. And I think if parents were given the choice between trying medication and trying something other than medication, I think they'd you know, like to can at least have that option. And I think the parents at the time were saying the same kind of thing. So the TSA went in and collected people from around the country who they knew had been doing some work in behavior therapy. And it's this group here. They brought us together and they locked us in the LaGuardia Marriott and said, you guys come up with an idea for a non-pharmacological treatment option. Give us a path forward. And so we quickly, because we were locked in LaGuardia Marriott, came up with <laughs> a suggestion for how we um, get you know, get some kind of non-pharmacological treatment option. We knew a couple things. We knew that habit reversal had to be a core element of this treatment, of any behavioral treatment, because we already knew that it had some power behind it. We also knew that habit reversal probably didn't go far enough because it didn't really address those kind of 
external environment things like reactions to ticks or the situational variables that make ticks worse. And we needed a systematic way to sort of address those two in treatment. So we combined habit reversal with those function-based interventions and a couple other things to create this what we called comprehensive behavioral intervention for ticks or CBIT. We proposed to do two very large studies. These are actually the two largest treatment outcome studies of any treatment where ticks is the focus um, in Tourette. So these are larger than any medication trial for where ticks is the focus. Um, and we developed a child study and an adult study. And we were going to compare behavior therapy to a psychoeducation and supportive therapy control condition. All right. We did these studies. We got them funded through the National Institutes of Mental Health. And they both basically had the same kind of design. You, we took them, we randomly assigned the kids and the adults into the CBIT or the control condition. CBIT was eight sessions of treatment over 10 weeks, two 90-minute sessions at the front, and then uh, the rest were 60-minute sessions. We had somebody who wasn't the treating clinician evaluate them at baseline, in the middle of treatment, and at the end of treatment. If that clinician felt that they had gotten a meaningful response, uh, gotten clinical benefit from this treatment, they were uh, given three once a month booster sessions, okay, reminder sessions. And then we followed to see how they did three months later and six months later. If they didn't respond to treatment, we didn't waste any more of their time. We let them, let them go okay, and tried to come up with some other option for them. All right. These are what the treatment components were. You can see have reversal, function-based intervention, psychoeducation. We had a reward system, but we never reward kids for not having ticks. That's not the right way to go. What we reward is we, we reward them for being compliant with treatment, for working hard in treatment, for um, you know, trying hard. And what the analogy I give to parents is something like this. I've actually had parents come up to me before. I've had a parent come up to me and said, you know, this reward stuff doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. I'm like, oh, what would you try? He goes, well. I told my daughter once that uh, if she didn't tick for a week, I would buy her a car. She couldn't last a day. I'm like, no, no, she, she, she probably couldn't. Um, but let me tell you, let me have you give a different bet. Do this bet with her. Bet her that if she does her competing responses, her exercises, every time she feels the urge to tick, and she does that in the next week, then she gets the car. I guarantee she'll be driving around in the car. Okay. She might have ticks, but she'll have, you know, she'll have that car, too. Um, because what we do in reward system is we try to reward them for working the treatment, for being compliant with the treatment. We really don't get too hung up on whether the ticks are happening or not. It's kind of the same way as you know, if you have a diabetic child, what can you hold them responsible for and what can you not hold them responsible for? Well, if you have a diabetic child, you know, think of diabetes. The, the, there is no cure for it. The effective management strategy is essentially all behavior therapy. Check your blood sugar, learn how to take your insulin, learn how to eat right, learn how to exercise, all that kind of stuff. And you can hold your child responsible for doing those things. You know, you can get, you can get mad at them and give them time out if you find them hoarding candy bars, for example, um, or, or not following their insulin checking regimen or something like that. You can, you can do that. Um, it, but you would never punish your child for having a bad pancreas. You know, <laughs> your pancreas is shot. You go to time out. You know, it, it, the same way you wouldn't punish a child for having ticks, but you could hold them responsible for not using their, their management strategies. Okay. In any case, um, the sample that we tested for the children, we had uh, about age of 12 of these 126 kids, mostly male, average IQ, 40% were on tick-reducing meds in a very stable family environment. Uh, most of them had Tourette's. They had a lot of other diagnoses too, ADHD, OCD. These are full-blown current diagnoses, not past diagnoses. After 10 weeks of treatment, we looked at the percent of kids who were clinically improved. And what did clinically improved mean in this study? It meant very much improved or much improved. Very much improved was a CGI, clinical global impression score, of one or two. That meant they either had virtually no ticks and no impairment, or their ticks were greatly, greatly, greatly down from baseline, and the impairment was much lower, tick-related impairment. So that's CGI of one or two. There was a third category of a CGI of three, and in this study, CGI of three meant there was improvement. So they, there was some benefit. It just wasn't enough to, for us to say, yeah, there was some real power behind this change. Okay. So what did we find? At the end of 10 weeks of treatment, eight sessions, 53% of the kids in CBIT were improved versus 
uh, 19% of the supportive therapy kids. Now this difference here between here and here, that's the, the effect of behavior therapy. In here is the effects of feeling like you're going to get help. In here is the normal passage of time where ticks will generally get better anyway. In here is uh, the, the, the idea of learning more about ticks and becoming more comfortable with it as a family. All those kinds of effects are built right into here. Beyond this is the effect of behavior therapy. All right. Their ticks got less severe on a tick severity measure compared to the supportive therapy. They, be, they had less tick-related impairment uh, in the behavior therapy condition relative to the supportive therapy following 10 weeks. And when we look six months later at who responded initially, so uh, we found uh, some interesting findings. 86% of those who were responders at the end of 10 weeks were still responders at the end of three months. 87% of those who were responders at the end of 10 weeks we're still responders at the end of six months. So what does that tell us? That tells us if you get benefit, and 53% do, that there's just a really good chance that the benefit's going to stick around. It's not going anywhere. This lasts. Is that what you No. This is, I mean, how, whatever the kids do, we don't follow it. If they, some, some do it, some don't. Some start, keep doing the exercises, some don't. Yeah. But that's 87% maintenance. Tick, tick reduction, um, significant reduction in tick severity for those who responded. So if you responded, your tick severity stayed low six months later. Your impairment stayed low six months later. Yeah? Are they, what if they stop doing the exercise? Do the ticks come back? Sometimes, sometimes not. Yeah. And either way, we're okay. Because, again, we don't, we don't profess to cure anything. We t we're teaching a tick management strategy. That's, that's what we're teaching. And you can use your management strategies or you cannot use your management strategies. The more consistently you use them, the easier it will get, the better it will get. And there's a chance you may never have to use them again. Um, but maybe you will, and then you have to get right back on the horse. Yeah. Is there any part of this that would benefit a child that does not have the discriminatory urge to like these young, these two young? Well, we, do, we generally, uh, we don't do it this way for younger kids, all right? Um, we, we, uh, Usually start around the age of eight or nine where we'll do this full protocol. You can do stuff with kids that are a little bit younger. Okay, so for example, um, uh, I have a, a son who, who is a little ticky. He has some, some facial tics and, and stuff like that. And my wife um, it knows what I do. She's a, she's a master's level psychologist. And so um, she, and my son's nine. And, and uh, so she, one day when he was probably like five or something like that, I noticed him walking, or he was around the house, and he was going, woo, woo, starting to drive us nuts a little bit. And I never, wa never was sure whether it was a tick or if it was just kind of him being excited, because it was always at an exciting time when he did this. And he would go, woo, woo. It was driving my wife and I crazy. And so we knew enough not to react to it, not to, not to say anything to it in case it was a tick. And, and finally, I came in one day from work, and I was walking in the door, and he was walking down the steps, you know, walking down. And, woo. What you doing, Sullivan? Mommy told me whenever I felt like I had to do this or when I did it, I should do breathing until I don't feel like I have to do it anymore. Okay. Good job. And stopped. It, was, it never happened again. Okay. And a, you know, another example, I was coaching him in baseball, and I'm, I'm watching him from the dugout, and he's on first base. And I... Um, I saw him out in the outfield on the first base, and he was sitting there like this with his glove. This is when he was about seven. And uh, he looks up, at, you know, he, it's a nice day out, and I'm in the dugout watching him, and I see him look up at the sun, and he goes, I'm like, hmm, I haven't seen that one before. And watch. Come here, buddy. What you doing? I don't know, which is true. They never know what they're doing. They're just kind of hanging out and existing. <laughs> what are you doing, buddy? I don't know. What, what, I saw you do that. What was that? He goes, I don't know. I felt like I had to look at the sun. I felt like I had to do it. Oh, okay. Hey, you know, whenever you feel that again, next time, just put your glove down and hold your hand at your side and make your neck a little tight like this. And just do that until you feel like you don't have to do it anymore. Okay? All right, Dad. Trots back out to first. Stuff like this. 
looks at me, and I'm like, <laughs> did that a few times, and that was it. Never happened again. You know, it, it, so it, can we do it with younger kids? It looks different. It's not, not quite the same the way we do it maybe in, in session, but I think you can. Um, they don't always have to have the feeling. They don't always have to have the urge, and this can work. It's harder to treat a little bit sometimes if they, don't, if they can't become aware of the urge and, uh, or um, the urge just isn't there. The truth is, though, even younger kids, most of them have the urge if you know how to find it. They, you know, the, the problem is that the, isn't that the younger kids don't have an urge. It's that they don't really have language to describe what that is. They don't know how to talk about it. Okay, so there, there's a piece of that. We, we looked at something else, too. What happens to other behavior problems, other issues that kids with Tourette's often have if you treat their tics, if you successfully treat their tics? Because there's some concern in different parts of the, of, of the literature, you know, people who write, like, notes or, or popular press books, sometimes you'll read these kinds of things. There's not much data to support what they say, but they, they write about these concerns that if you teach kids to, you know, do you stop their tics like this or reduce their tics like this, that it'll have negative side effects. And some of the negative side effects is that they'll get more anxious, they'll get more stressed, they'll have more trouble paying attention, they'll get angry at you, those kinds of things. And so we wanted to look at that. And what we looked at here is, these, this is the child behavior checklist. This is a big measure of all problem behaviors in children, like a global measure of behavior problems in kids. And what we found was that in kids who got, whose tics got greatly reduced as a result of behavior therapy, the kids who got CBIT successfully, six months later, all of their behavior problems were lower. They just had lower behavior problems. When we looked at the specific types of behavior problems, if they got successful benefit from CBIT, if their tics were successfully reduced as a result of CBIT, then six months later they were less anxious. Six months later they were less disruptive. So there seems to be some positive spillover. If you get significant benefit from this, if you get significant benefit, there can be significant benefits in other areas beyond just the tics. Now, what about comparison? How does this stack up? Yeah. Sometimes their tics will come back. Um, sometimes they don't need to do the practices anymore because there's just no urge to tick anymore. And so. If they're, so they're, if they're still ticking and they're just not getting on board with the treatment. Um, then their tics might go back up. I mean, that, that could happen if if the you know it cycles back up again. It could definitely do that. Yeah. 